on April 1st, 2024 to order. Uh, I'm Shane Clausen, council president. I'll be filling in for Josh Moaning, who's out of town today. Um, I'd like to inform the public about the location of the Open Meetings Act posted in the northwest uh, corner of uh, the council chambers and is accessible to members of the public. At this moment, uh, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance right afterwards. Uh, during our moment of silence, I'd like to recognize our councilman, Justin Storton, who recently lost his father. So if you could think about that while we're... Roll call, please. Granquist? Here. Arns? Here. Webb? Here. McCarthy? Here. Clausen? Here. Murin? Here. Snorton? Here. Hildebrand? Here. Okay, we're at the recommended actions part of our meeting. I would like uh, to get a motion to approve the consent agenda. Your Honor, I'll be abstaining from the consent vote. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Roll call, please. New technology. <laughs> Voting in the affirmatives. Affirmative. Granquist, Arns, Snorton, Webb, Hildebrand, Clausen, Murin, abstaining, McCarthy, motion carries. All right. Well, now I need to get a motion to, for approval of the full agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the full agenda. Second. All right. Roll call. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, so we've got a couple special presentations tonight. Um, or I mean proclamations, I'm sorry. Proclamations tonight. Um, the first one is the proclamation uh, for April 2024 as Fair Housing Month. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read that, and then I'll ask for acceptance of the proclamation after that. Oh, just give me a Okay. Uh, the Fair Housing Proclamation. Whereas April 11, 2024 marks the 56th anniversary of the passage of the U.S. Fair Housing Law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended, which indicates a national policy for fair housing without regard to race, color, creed, national origin, sex, familial status, and handicap, and encourages fair housing opportunities for all citizens. And whereas the Norfolk Housing Agency and the Norfolk Housing Development Division of the City of Norfolk are committed to highlight to highlight the Fair Housing Law Title VII of the City or Civil Rights Act of 1968 by continuing to address discrimination in our community to support programs that will be that educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and to plan partnership efforts with other organizations to help ensure every American of their right to fair housing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Shane Clausen, Council President of the City of Norfolk, Nebraska, by the power, power vested in me, do here pride proclaim April 24th as Fair Housing Month. And I don't believe there's anyone to Okay. Do we have somebody to accept this? Yep. Got a little more work at this job. Usually I'm just sitting there. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to have another proclamation for April 2024 as National Child Abuse Awareness Month. <clears throat> proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month. 
whereas ch ch child abuse and neglect in a community problem that depends on involvement among people throughout the community and whereas some ch child maltreatment occurs when people find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and don't know how to cope and whereas the majority of child abuse cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an, in an engaged and supportive community. And whereas child abuse and neglect can be reduced by making sure each family has the support they need to raise their children in a healthy environment. And whereas children, <coughs> child abuse and neglect not only directly harms children, but also increases the likelihood of criminal behavior, substance abuse, health problems, such as heart disease and obesity, and risky behaviors such as smoking and alcohol usage, and whereas all citizens should become involved in supporting families and raising their children in a safe, nurturing environment. And whereas effectively, child abuse prevention programs exceed because of the partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, faith communities, civil organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. Now, therefore, I, Shane Kloss, and City Council President of the City of Norfolk, by the power vested in me, do hereby proclaim April as Child Prevention Month in Norfolk and the surrounding area and call upon all citizens, community agencies, religious organizations, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their partnership and efforts to prevent child abuse, thereby strengthening the communities we, with which we live. Anyway, so, do we have somebody here to, ex okay. Okay, now the fun part. Um, we're going to open a uh, public hearing to, dis to consider the extremely blighted uh, determination of the area located at approximately 105 East Norfolk Avenue, the northeast corner of North First Street and East Norfolk Avenue. So, what? Oh, sorry, yeah. We're gonna back up just one here quick. Um, at this time, uh, City Administrator Ed Colvin is going to make a statement. Thank you, Councilman. So I wanted to read the statement that I prepared for the Mayor and Council and to put on a record uh, for the whole City Council and for the whole community to, to listen to. At the last Council meeting, a comment was made regarding my membership and that of the Mayor on the Greater Norfolk Economic Development Foundation. A question about a potential conflict of interest was brought to the forefront by our city clerk and city attorney who appropriately contacted the Nebraska Accountability and Disclosure Commission. The NADC issued an opinion that participation in discussion is permitted so long as the mayor does not cast a vote should that be necessary. City code also addresses potential con conflicts of interest for elected officials and staff and out of an abundance of caution Neither the mayor nor I will be participating in discussions or deliberations with regard to 105 East Norfolk Avenue because of our role with the foundation. However, I wanted to provide a statement to the city council and members of the public with respect to our involvement on the board. The Greater Norfolk Economic Development Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to create, facilitate, and support partnerships to develop quality economic growth in the Norfolk area. It has existed in various forms for over 60 years acquiring and holding land for industrial growth and expansion, in addition to advising the mayor and city leaders on economic development matters. A long line of community leaders have left a very strong legacy of focused dedication to the growth and betterment of Norfolk for our current and future generations. The foundation has evolved over time, adjusting its focus on the needs of the community. Recently, housing and quality of life have taken a front seat as the foundation works to help stop the loss of our youth, retain our workforce, and attract new residents. 
working with partners such as the Growing Together Initiative and Exarban Foundation, Norfolk, and Madison County's future is bright. Since 2017, I have served as an ex officio non-voting member of the Foundation Board on behalf of the city, while the mayor has served as a voting member, providing assistance and input, bridging the interests and requirements of the city of Norfolk with those of private sector community leaders who want to see our community flourish and succeed. Community success hinges upon positive relationships between government leaders and various groups within the private sector, small and large businesses, service industries, financial institutions, and large employers in our manufacturing base need the support of the city to ensure a healthy economy, suitable amenities, and sustainable job opportunities for all citizens. Every recommendation or input I or any other city official offered has had that fact in mind. I was not paid to serve on the board, nor do I have any personal financial interests or benefits in the activities or assets of the board. Any insinuation to the contrary is false. For decades, elected and appointed city leaders have played a critical role in community economic development in many ways, and that will continue into the future. Thank you, Councilman. I'll go sit down. All right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, now at this time, I'm going to open up the public hearing to consideration the extremely blighted determination of the area located at approximately 105 Steve Norfolk Avenue, the northeast corner of North First Street and East Norfolk Avenue. Also at this time, I'd like to uh, I'd obviously welcome, thank you for coming out and everybody's welcome to get up and speak when they have their chance. But when you do, um, I don't really wanna interrupt you right away. So please state your name and put your address down so I can, so you can continue to talk. I know what it's like to be interrupted then you lose your train of thought and I don't wanna do that. But I do welcome all of you up here and just be mindful of your time when you have your chance to talk. So at this time, we'll open the public hearing. Okay, and uh, we have Mark Otto here, and you come up, yep. Perfect. Council, staff, people, it's great to be here again. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this project. This is relevant to the extreme blight study. Um, Kurt Elder presented that, uh, whatever it's been now, about a month ago, and it met all the legal statutes. It, you know, it met the, the unemployment rate, it met the poverty rate, so legally, the extreme blights are good to go, right? The question is, why are we doing it? Um, this project has been before the city um, for quite a while. It, it's, it's a hard one to put through. Um, it's, it's a type of project where you don't throw the numbers together and go, oh, wonderful, let's go. It takes a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of angles of how can we get there? What's the participation? Um, and I noticed in Lincoln just this weekend, they announced in the old Sears building, there's a TIF and EEA being put in. Um, so that, that building that's been sitting empty for a while will now turn. A little different animal, but similar process to what they're trying to accomplish. So I put together a chart because the question is, how does this impact the city? Um, and I've talked to you about how wonderful I think it's for the city, how many people it's going to draw in, the type of response you'll get. But what, what are the hard numbers on the site? So I put together a chart with a 3% growth for the existing structure and the structure that we're presenting. And... The existing structure, I would mind, is 46 years old, I believe. So if you look at the tax base on that structure over the last three or four years, it's kind of wavered, um, which is understandable. Uh, but on this chart, I put together a 3% growth model. And if you look at uh, 2045, line six, that would show without this project happening, the existing structure with the tax base would bring in $891,000. 000, 
with this project, it would bring in 4.8. The net gain to the city before the TIF is completed is 3.9 million. If we go to 2046, just one year ahead, that 3.9 goes to 4.7 million. 10 years later, 13 million. 20 years later, 26. And the 50 year model, which I keep bringing up, is so important for cities to look at. It's a $44 million gain. Um, that's pretty substantial. And, and maybe the, the number that's most interesting is in 2046 on the percent of Norfolk property tax budget, the existing structure is six tenths of a percent of the property tax for the city. This structure will be 7.4% of the property tax when it comes off the blight and substandard. That's a pretty real number. I mean, that's something that's impactful. It's an investment. If you were building your 401k and you had this model, you'd say, let's do it. Um, the estimated payoff I thought was, was important. I calc those numbers. Uh, year 16, we talked about a 20-year blight, and there's all sorts of ways to work TIF, right? You can do escalations and this and that. The extreme blight is such a straightforward way to accomplish what we set to accomplish. There's no escalation factors built into the project, only here to kind of show what the payoff would be. I believe it'll pay off in year 16, and I wouldn't be surprised if it paid off ahead of that. Um, we're, we're at a time where this project not only is critical to itself, that piece of ground sat there for a long time, but I do think it'll draw to downtown Norfolk and Norfolk as a whole. So often people look at community development and they say it's this or that. It's this and that, almost always this and that. You need multiple factors to come together. People are concerned, you know, should we be spending our money as a city here or on jobs? Your unemployment rate is in the twos, I believe, right now. Go try to solicit a factory or an industry from this national level with that unemployment rate. It's pretty tough. You need housing. It all has to work together. It's this and that. So... I promised I wouldn't go too long. It seemed like you had a busy session. There, there is the breakdowns in there if you have questions um, on where my numbers came from or what have you. But uh, maybe it would help be beneficial if you clarify, like you know, the before twenty forty five, the model you're you're using. So you're saying that the net tax on the lot from twenty twenty four is this, and then you you you, you added those up. That yeah. period of 16 years and then could you could you click on the with verse without tab that i'm a self-taught spreadsheet guy so don't be judgmental <laughs> it uh i went with the without in the first column and it just shows where the property tax was today and where it would continue to grow uh, in column d if you get to column g You'll notice that property tax goes from thirty-three thousand down to sixty-seven hundred. We're going to tear down the structure that's there, which will reset the base year on that lot. So for the model, I used just the land for property tax. To the right of that is your sales tax revenue that we anticipate generating on this project. Uh, we anticipate $4.5 million a year, and that would give you a 3% growth factor on it. So you can see in the yellow column D, you're 33 and growing. And if you go to column K, which is a comparable, it's, it's over double uh, what the city's income will be on just this property. And then I, I highlighted line 30, which shows 2041. Uh, in the center, I bolded that out to show that that 16 year, if you do the running balances, will we'll catch up and pay off this TIF project. 
And so it, it should be a live project in 2042 for a tax roll. And 2042, the estimated tax I have is 693.904. So you're that, um, with that width category up on 2026, that basically stating that 67,500, that's your anticipated sales tax? Yes. Okay. Yeah. For that year. Yeah. And I, I took a one and a half percent model, which I believe is the city's okay. take on that. Right. That's right. And, so, and you'll note on uh, line 30 again, where we're 693, the existing structure would be uh, 51,668. Sorry, line 31. 53,000 versus 693,000. That's pretty substantial. Yeah. And, you know, that's not getting into the quality of life and the stuff that it brings. This is just a straightforward, how does that piece of property compare with or without? And my blue didn't show up, unfortunately, on the width. I tried to do the yellow and blue make screen, mm -hmm. but it didn't represent as easily. And as with all things, I always send my spreadsheets in spreadsheet form versus PDF. So if you've got questions about calculations or whatever, we can forward that on so you can go through the formulas and methodologies. So the tax base would be without the building? Yeah, the tax base would be without the building, which is something new here in Norfolk. It's common somewhere else where you would tear down a structure to reset your tax base, but my understanding is it's newer here to do. If we didn't have the city sales tax to offset that and create a growth, I can see where it's a greater issue. Um, I go back to the 30 ways that it took to put this project together. If it was a straightforward, easy project, we wouldn't be looking at EAs, right? We wouldn't look at extreme blight. It's just that tight of a project. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we can try to do something. Yeah, she's, she's oh, yeah. is that better? <coughs> okay. So, Mark, with the sales tax revenue, are you predicting, so in the six, first six years, my math's right, you can generate around, roughly around $2 million in sales in retail or sales tax revenue? Um, to to collect the three hundred and some thousand you're saying here three hundred ten thousand on the six year so right to the right of the underneath the width column I I did a running balance mm -hmm. and so year one two three four the running balance would be your calculation okay and column H would be the individual year with a three percent growth model. So are you predicting up this sales tax to have all new businesses in your development? Yes. So right, there, we got, we'll go you ahead. don't think you'll have existing sales? You don't think existing businesses will move um, from somewhere else in the city to your, your development? You think this is all brand new? You're going to create all these new businesses to create all this new revenue? That's a fair question. I don't know that answer yet. I wish Megan were here. Um, we've talked to local businesses um, who have talked of expansion. Um, we have talked to two that have talked about moving from a location that's not, you know, as prime. So that that would be a fair factor to try to analyze what that would mean. Um, I don't know that I've got enough information to dissect that yet. Um, we're working to get to our 50% LOI um, to bring this project together. That's the part where the bank feels comfortable. Um, once we've got that number, they're like, okay, let's, you know, we can feel good about this. 
there's there's going to be some interesting spaces on that question. I've got three units. I've kind of tagged out their smaller units that I want to be incubator spaces so that we can, and it's going to be seasonal. So instead of asking a new business to come in and make a two-year, three-year commitment, I want to do them seasonally and by month so that if, if your business model fits the summer model and the kayaking and et cetera, can people get a start there? And then as we get to the Christmas season, it's a different model. So... I, I can't answer that fully, what that breakdown is going to look like yet. I think if you're talking about minimizing the base, so taking the base down to 6,077, and you're going to do it off the forecast of projected sales tax revenue, that has to be concrete. You have to say this is, to make up for this base, this is what I'm, I'm projecting. If, if I'm 50% right, it's a push, right? It's a lock number. Well, you ha if that's new business. Right. I don't, I don't have a model to lock in all the businesses that quickly. I mean, I wish I did. We'd be a lot further ahead today than we are. Yeah. Um, I know that our target has not just been Norfolk and growth in Norfolk. Um, Megan's looked and reached out to surrounding areas. And so I, I, I just don't know what that makeup will look like yet. I, I want you to be successful too. So I, I want what you propose to actually come to fruition. I don't want you to learn the market after all this approval. Um, I'll just say, when you talk incubator space, I know a little bit about that. What we get for rent downtown is around four dollars a square foot. Yep. And we build in a website for them. They uh, that's all their utilities, their Wi-Fi. That's trash. That's water. That's everything. So I just want you to understand that going into this. Now. That's, those are numbers I think you need to understand as yeah, you go into and, this development. And I think your incubator is a doer space. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, a couple years old. Yeah, and, and it's working very well. We actually toured it. I, I'm impressed. Ours is going to be more of the anticipation of a sales point. How, how can somebody have a sales point in a high traffic area? And will that give them enough to launch their business forward. Yeah, you, but you're still competing with these spaces. I mean, you, you still have to, as, as I own a business too. Sure. And I can't tell you how tough it is to run a business, especially in retail. You know, then you need to add a service to it. And I only tell you these things because I want you to be successful. I want you to propose something that um, is exactly what it's supposed to be and what you say it's going to be. Um, and I think this market, there's a lot to learn in it because with the sales tax numbers not matching, you know, you're saying it's, it's taking over your base. Um, that, that'll, that'll justify um, going down to 6,787. Those are all things that we just have to know. And you have to say it's, it's new sales tax. If it's not, then it's just pulling from the same pot. So I just want you to understand the market, understand what our downtown's beautiful. We've done amazing things. Yep. Um, it's progressive. It's forward thinking. It's, but it's not high dollar. It's not the rents. I know some developers are coming in asking for, I think $12 is a high per square foot. Um, but we're not getting anywhere near $27 per square foot. And so you really have to create a value somewhere to, to pull for that. So I, I, I do believe wholeheartedly you'll see this site and the foot traffic that you generate from this. It, it's just something that you haven't seen here. When you do these pedestrian strips, I was just watching a thing this morning. If you ever watch a guy named City Beautiful on YouTube, it's phenomenal, right? You learn so much about how the country develops. Um, and he was talking about a real touristy area in Philadelphia, Esther Street or something like that. It's a narrow pathway between homes on both sides, no businesses. People still tour it for the feel of it. Um, when we bring this site in and you start to see it unfold, I, I just don't know that you guys have seen anything here yet in outstate Nebraska yet that the draw that something like this creates. And when we bring that draw into that foot traffic, I think you're going to see that multiply. I, I don't think people are going to walk our diagonal block, which is about a block and a half, 
by the time you curve through it. I don't think you'll see them just walk that and go, okay, let's go home, right? I think you're going to see them continue through the downtown, and you're going to start to see a model downtown that's already done incredibly well and continue to grow. And they've done this in a lot of other regions, this walkable neighborhood. Matter of fact, I've been told they're starting to do it out of, outside of stadiums now. So they're trying to create these pedestrian areas outside of stadiums, right, to get people, getting people to a baseball game or basketball game, whatever, is one thing. But if you're coming from 100 miles away, do you just want to spend two hours jumping in your car and head back? They're trying to extend this experience. And I really think that's what you're going to see out here is an extension of an experience so that when you have a festival or something here, you're growing from an area. If we can extend that experience, that area can grow. We won't know until it's factual, right? Absolutely. Until we look back on history and hope I'm right. We're, we're putting a $32 million guess that we're right. Mark, I do have a question for you. Um, so at what point do you think you'll be at 100% capacity in the commercial um, spaces? So we, we expect to be 50% uh, by the time we close on the property. And Bank's pretty adamant about that. Um, and I feel really good about it. Um, the, the response... And, and what date would that be? Uh, closing, my anticipation is we'd finish council June 17th is I think on our schedule, our last day. Um, if everything stays on pace, it's a tight schedule. June 18th, we would close on the property. So by June 18th, we would be 50%. And then June 19th, we anticipate breaking ground and open up the project on November 1st. So the hundred percent model is what I'd like to be by November first, twenty twenty five. The fifty percent model is critical for June. And so these numbers that you've come up with, the four and a half million and three percent growth, that's factoring in your fifty percent? That's at a hundred percent. That's model. at a hundred percent. So twenty twenty six you think, you think yep. you're at a hundred percent going forward. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That's lofty, Mark. 2026 to be 100%. That's, that's a lofty goal. I respect lofty goals. I, you have to be realistic. Um, and um, I know a little bit about filling commercial space. That's why I'm telling you that that, sure. is, that is lofty. We, we feel good about it. Okay. Uh, if we didn't, um, we'd be looking at a different process, right? We yeah. uh, understand this project, when a, when a city supplies TIF, tax, um, sales tax, EA. the city's not forking out money up front saying, boy, we hope you can make this work for us. The city's saying, it's up to you. We're going to rebate your property tax. We're going to collect on the sales tax. A city signs a bond, but they don't put cash behind the bond. Is that a fair statement? The developer makes the payment to the city or the state, however you want to calc it, and that money comes back around. And I think so often people miss that. They think, oh, here's a developer is getting a check. The city's taking the gamble. The beauty of TIF, which is why I preach it in every community I go to, the developer takes the risk. The city says, hey, if you can make it, you can pay your property taxes, I'll give it back to you. This is a partnership. We will partnership. But if you can't, and you don't pay your property taxes, you're not getting a check. That's the beauty of the model of TIF. It puts all the weight back on the developer, which is why I think it's such a good program. What happens, what happens Mark? Say, say you come with a, a different analysis of the market, and you say, you know what, we wanted $32 million, but $20 million, that's that's the market, you know. 75% of the commercial space, I was thinking, and, you know, 90% of the, the residential space. What happens to the project then? It won't get built, first of all. 
when when you take the cost of the land to do this project, the tear down, the removal, the restart, the reboot, this project is sized exactly what it needs to be to cash flow. Wow. Right on. Um, I would tell you, I mentioned my banker, Brandon Boley at Home Federal, has walked me through years of education. And when I present something to him, he just shreds me, and I love it. We sit down, and he goes, I don't know. You can look at this. Where's your model? How do you prove this? Where does that number come from? Let's talk about this at a deeper level. If this model makes it through the bank, through my partners, through the developers, um, you, you've got to look at that and go, geez, there's something right here, right? These guys are, are really sticking their neck out for a reason. <laughs> they're stepping up. They're, they're putting a project together that's sat for, I don't know how many years, a long time. Yeah. And if, if we say, you know what, it's risky, let's all go home, that's not good for the community. Um, it's not, it is not good to entice future developers. Um, we've done what I think is a really good job in being fully disclosed to you guys what we're going to do, how we're going to do it from the day one meeting. Um, today's not a new session, right? Um, we've tried to go on day one. If this is a project you're interested in, let's talk about it. And if it's not, let's move forward. Because on the development side, um, beyond my time, which I do value incredibly, the dollars spent every day towards moving this project forward are dramatic. You know, we don't, when, when you talk about finishing council on the 17th and breaking ground on the 19th, you're not starting your architecture and engineering down the road. Um, it's in full motion, it's in full steam, and it's always how I've operated. And if you look back, and you say, hey, Mark, slow down. Why don't you just wait a year and let this whole thing cycle? What's your build cost a year later? 7% higher, 8% higher. So $30 million becomes 32.4. 32.4 becomes 34. Like, you have to account for the time. Possibly so. cheaper interest rates. <laughs> just I saying. So. No. <laughs> you know what? There, there's a good model. The, a good discussion to have right now. If you brought a project anywhere three years ago at 3% interest, it was really easy to put a project together, right? 3% interest. That's virtually free money by all standards. Didn't help with inflation and building product costs. That model of 3% making a project work, pretty feasible. Go look at a project with a seven, seven and a quarter, seven and a half. Um, we were all hoping for lower interest rates as the summer ticked on. Doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates are going to hold kind of as what we're anticipating at this point. Mark, how many phases would you have with this project? One phase. Just one phase. Yep. We start on June 19th, finish November 1st, which is actually 500 days, so it's our summer project. If you've seen the movie 500 Days of Summer, I thought it fit. Mark, that was retail and residential? Yeah, the, the commercial on the done. first floor, we want to build out as we can fill the tenants, which is why we're aggressively going after LOIs, getting commitments, getting into design. When you build the retail at the same time as the residential, you can help their costs so dramatically because you're not cutting out concrete to rebuild it, right? You're not going backwards to go forward. The facades, these going to have pretty cool facades. I've got to put a facade on it if the space is empty. If I've got a tenant that says, hey, I want to be in there, let's meet on this facade, we're paying to put their facade on. That's something that quite often you, you lease a space and you redo the front, right? You inhibit or you incur those costs. We're trying to offset that for people that are coming in. So 27 bucks is a lot more than people are used to paying downtown. When they start to calc what they're getting for indoor space, outdoor space and opportunity, um, 
some of those numbers aren't as dramatic as you think. Well, uh, has a 50% margin um, with, say, a million in revenue and a couple employees. Mm -hmm. It's not feasible. What's that? $27 a square foot with a million in revenue and a couple employees. $27 is not feasible. So do you know the type of business you're going to have to market to? Yeah, and we are. And the businesses themselves are looking at their own books. Um, so I'm just... and I'll give you one example. The guy, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into who it is or what it was, but he said, i got to generate $80 more a day to occupy this space. Yeah. $80 more a day. When you look at the generation, the commitment that Norfolk had to the park, to the river, to the people that will come to the river, you add this pedestrian experience, $80 a day is not dramatic. You're saying to pay the lease payment. What's that? You're to cover the lease the offset. And that was going from a 13 to a 27. Yeah, it's just hard. I don't, just I don't know if it's the right level of questioning. We're you're questioning a business model tonight, and, well, and then you've it, got a developer who's done well, is willing to do a thirty-two million dollar project, and typically, just like you've been so you've been trying to, I think, be patient and with your with the questions that are coming at you, but most time the research and development that's being done through your your bank and with your business partners, they go through that and highlight all that because they know not many people are willing to put that much money out there with that much risk, especially with a TIF bond risk on top of that, because you're on the hook for that no matter what. And if you if you your business model fails, you're still on the hook for it. And you've got to be producing so that that taxable dollars equal the amount that you bond. So there's a ton of risk on the developer, and, and, that, and you kind of went into that a little bit. But I think to go into this rent, that rent, I mean, there's, real, I, there's I see some people out here that work in that side of the business. There are places that change their rent model. Some rent models are, I'll uh, include your build-out cost into your square footage lease, which then push you up to some of the rent costs he's talking about. But then some are just, you've built it out and you're just actually leasing. You know, that does drop your rent like you're talking about. Yeah. So there's different models you can use to get to your rent. And sometimes it works, sometimes different rents work for different people because they can't go to the bank right off the bat and borrow the actual build-out cost. So then the developer then finances the build-out costs for them and, and increasing their rents to do so. But it works in the long term for the person within it. So we can go on and on about well, I mean, what, what, what's going to go, you know, how they're going to make this cash flow. But the bottom line is we're just talking about a blight study tonight. Well, the, f the fact is... I mean, that that's what we need to be really conscious about. Shane, the, this isn't the, about... But no, it, it, it's all so tied together. So when, as a council, we approve this, there's a planning commission being tomorrow to resurvey right. it. Right. So, so, I mean, so an approval here means kind of an approval for everything. What do you, th what do you think the council was in 1970 when they approved a, uh, Mark, the zoning much, for the mall? How much I mean, TIF are you asking for from the community? How much is total TIF, do you think, roughly? this one is $4.5 million with a 7% interest factor, which is what matches others. So that total number. So the community is going to be invested in this at $5 million. I think we're a business partner. The, the, the community is not invested in anything. It's for giving tax dollars. I know some developers say, hey, this is money I've created. This is my money. But I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that when you improve a property, the improvements go to Madison County, they go to the schools, they go to all these different entities. And then you're asking for forgiveness. So you're asking for that to be your money instead of the community's. I know there's argument that says that's not... The community, when I look at it, is we're a four or five million dollar partner with you in this community in this development. We want to see it be successful. That's the way I look at it. So that's kind of my questions. I'm not trying to overstep. You haven't offended me a bit. I, I would. I mean, I respect any conversation that has. So. Have you ever sat in a meeting with Randy Gates? <laughs> you, get, you get asked a lot of questions. So. I just want to be successful and. Uh, be what it says it's going to be and I believe the community when you come and ask for TIF I believe that we're a business partner and that's the way I look at it so. yeah, and I, I certainly believe in the public I mean if you look at our website it's about public private partnerships um, and I do think that's what it is we're bringing something to your town that is going to be incredible for Norfolk it's going to set Norfolk apart of all the other communities around 
And I just had seen the stuff on Pierce this weekend. It was in the Norfolk Daily News of the different things, how they're... Look at the pocket that we're building in Northeast Nebraska. It's incredible. And I've, I've talked about the whaling communities of New England that were just horrible, and they decided, hey, how do we, how do we turn this corner? And now people visit there like crazy. When you look at the opportunity here, it's, it's really it's special. Hmm. It's really special. One last question, then I'll get out of your hair. Is there a way you can do this without touching the tax base? Because sales tax re revenue doesn't go to the schools or the county. Yeah. Uh, I wish there was. Um, I wish there was a way. When I say I, I went through 30 models to find a path to make this work, my partner Tommy said, hey, it's all a riddle, man. Just figure it out. Day after day, hour after week after week, how can this work? Um, I can tell you I had no intent of going into development. Um, I've got a consulting thing. We're, we're really proud of it. We're trying to accomplish housing across the state of Nebraska. Nobody was jumping on this project. Um, the cities presented it. I presented it to people. Nobody jumped on it. Um, I stepped up, and I went out, and I got people to participate and put in their money, and that's where we're at. Thanks. Mark, I have just one quick question for you. <clears throat> so you indicated you think you are anticipating maybe a 16-year payoff on this. So the extreme blight is needed from a regular blight just for that one year, or you, you just need those five years to, to make the numbers work? Yeah, so on, a, on an extreme blight, you're going to monetize your money at a 20-year. One thing Norfolk doesn't do, and Randy will not let you do, is do an extension so you're going to grow your model out and say, hey, this model is going to be worth more every year. Let's use that for a tax base. Some communities allow that. They'll say, hey, it's worth whatever today. It'll be worth this. Let's figure the TIF based on that. Um, I've, I've said here in any community I go to, you have the best staff that you're going to find in the state of Nebraska. Um, everything is by the book. It's straightforward, and it's hardline. Um, if you read the state auditor report, what, five years ago? You probably didn't appear in it, did you? Um, every other community, did, including Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, if you read that report, it was really interesting because TIF, TIF's gray in most communities. Everybody's got a methodology. Here, to create the amount of money to generate on the 20-year, most TIF pays off early. Is that a fair statement? So this one at a 20-year will pay off in 16. But every dollar keeping that property, raising it, tearing it down to reset that base, which is standard in any other community, all those items were needed. When I say it's a riddle, like we, we, you know, we didn't just come up on day one and say, oh, let's go do a 20-year EEA, 20-year uh, extreme, do an EEA, let's raise the building first. It was cycling through these numbers over and over. And when you do rents, you don't, you don't just get to bank them up, right? We've, we had to go find models that have worked in other urban settings and other, other areas and say, okay, if they can get this, we can get this. You got too much money invested for whales. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and time. I'm going to be 50 this year, which isn't something to everybody, but two years of my life is going to be spent up here in Norfolk building this project, creating the management team, creating that model and making sure it launches in the right direction. Two years isn't everything to everybody, but to me it is. I value that. I think that's good, yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Michael Sands, 1700 Farnham, uh, Baird Home on behalf of the city. I'm the city's special TIF council. 
Uh, I should have beat uh, Mr. Otto to the podium because, well, I know it's everybody wants to see what's behind the curtain. Kind of want to pull it back down just because of some comments that that were made uh, in that conversation. So tonight we we obviously are just talking about the EBA, and you know I'm not asking you to turn your focus away from what's coming next because certainly if if you proceed. Uh, to designate as an EBA, certainly uh, this will be before you again. But point being, uh, there will be a public hearing and a process for the actual TIF approval, EA approval, the things that he'll be asking for. And I primarily tell you that just because any decision you would make tonight would want to be based on the actual criteria of the EBA and not what you think is coming after. Because um, certainly, while well, you have a lot of discretion under the uh, under the statutes, um, a decision that's made for, you know, reasons that are patently false or in inapplicable is kind of the one no-no of these sorts of things. So just wanted to, to make clear, and I know that you already know that, but I just wanted to, uh, to reemphasize that. Aside from uh, of that little uh, um, warning, I just, you know, I've, I've obviously reviewed the EBA or the study. Um, a lot of the work on these is already done when it's deemed blighted and substandard, so you really just have the two, uh, you know, extra levels or extra criteria that it needs to meet. Um, certainly the met methodology is sound, the process is sound in the EBA, so uh, it appears from, from legal's perspective that everything done is being done or, or presented is, is in compliance with the statutes. Certainly happy to answer any questions you have, and I know probably a lot of other folks will be uh, speaking on this matter, so feel free to call me up if I can be of, of any assistance in answering their questions as well. Appreciate it. I got a question for you. So when it goes off the unemployment rate for extreme blight, is that for citizens that are actually retired also? Well, so it's based, uh, most of this is based on census data information. And, and to be quite honest, I mean, that, that would be a better question for the consultant um, as far as, as what, but it doesn't specify in the, uh, in the statutes itself whether, um, but I think it's based on the, whatever the federal, fed, federally stated census track unemployment rate is for the area. I don't know. The calculations that go in, into that particular calculation. I mean, so you're asking if if unemployment considers retirees within its. I, I don't know the question, to, or I don't know the answer to that because it's it's just not a part of of that process with, within the TIF. Yep. Any other questions? Well, we, we, yeah, we'll just, you'll be here. So if we have, need some assistance, we'll appreciate I'll be it. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, okay. Feel free to come up. Council, I'm Kim Davis. I live at 310 Oak Street. Um, Oh, your pen don't write. Um, when I look at those figures, I, I kind of have to think about President Trump <laughs> being accused of overinflating the numbers and getting taken to court for that and paying a hefty fine, anybody can put numbers to paper. And in my mind, unless there's proof, they mean nothing. Is, I, I'm curious, they said that um, they were going to take it down to ground zero. So will the taxes that will be paid on this area be paid on what's being paid now with the buildings on it? Or will they be paid on what the property is without the buildings on it. Um, I also want to know if a contractor doesn't finish a project, what are the consequences to them? Do they have consequences? I was reading an article that uh, Gal wrote and it, it really concerns me and I'd like to just highlight it for you. 
It says that uh, Mark Otto was one of the developers on Legacy Bend. He uh, bragged about that in a press release, but he ultimately pulled out leg of Legacy Bend, leaving it unfinished. One entrance or exit for 120 par apartments, 20 homes and several townhomes. This is a safety concern. The other access roads have been fin never been finished. There are many vacant lots. There are several promised amenities, such as pocket parks, playgrounds, dog park, walking trail, and community garden. The blighted area was provided TIF to complete the project. However, the phases of this project have been left unfinished. Um, what, what are the consequences? What happens when uh, a company finishes what they do and then their tax runs out? They, they sell it, kind of like what happened with Tyson years ago. They leave the city because their tax break ran out. I just, it's a lot of money. It's, it's, it's really a an big, big project. And for the timeline, I, my head's spinning at how quick this timeline is. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say in this, this is comical, but I was stationed in Europe for many years and toured, gave tours to family and, and friends of the red light district. And if you look at the artist rendering of these buildings with the big windows, shop windows, and the apartments up above, it looks, and they said they want to give it the Amsterdam feel. Now that's, that's where I got this idea, but it looks like the brothel in Amsterdam. Just saying. We might get in some big trouble if that happens in Norfolk, Nebraska. <laughs> Do you want us to answer those questions, your first two questions anyway? Yeah, okay. Um, first question was, yeah, on the, 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 yes, and you, you want to answer that for us? Yeah. Sure. And which of the questions? Well, the first one was about um, taking the property down to the bare, bare property for the tax base. Sure, that. that's certainly what, what Mr. Otto um, built into these numbers. Like I said, nothing is being approved tonight. As far as what the legality of that, there is no prohibition for it <clears throat> under the law. Some communities um, allow for it, some don't. Some take it on a case-by-case -case basis just based upon the fact of how important the project might be and if it isn't viable without um, being able to reduce that base value. So. I, I believe that is what's presented in, in these numbers. I can't speak for Mr. Otto. As to the legality of it, there's nothing illegal about it, um, it which is really all I can say from, from my standpoint. As far as the, I think the second was the consequences of not finishing the project. Uh, that would, those, those types of provisions and, and penalties are built into what's called the redevelopment contract, which would <laughs> come after a redevelopment plan was approved. I'm, I'm sure you've see, all of you have seen many of those. Um, and that is the legal contract between the city and the developer. Um, and the penalties and those, with, with those often involve, A, it, the, um, the incentives are going to shut, shut off. Um, so they're not going to receive any more uh, TIF if they don't build what they say they're going to do, or EA, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, and the pr provisions beyond that can range from having to repay back what they've already received, but often that, that just doesn't need to happen, especially with a one-phase project, because you have to kind of get to the point of building what you say you're going to build to receive any TIF. There are very few scenarios, but for maybe a very long-phased residential subdivision where you will be recouping considerable considerable amounts of TIF or benefits with only being 50% done with the overall project or something like that. So typically, you know, if the project will not move forward, it would be at those earlier stages. Certainly the, the incentive would be shut off and there can be provisions that require the developer to pay back what any incentive money that they've received. So is anything happening with Legacy Ben? I can't speak to the progress of that development. I'm sorry. I don't know if we can speak to that because it's not on this particular subject right now. But it would be something we can, you know, I mean, I guess. Yeah. 
Mark, did you want to speak about on that? I mean, that's totally up to you. I, I can at least clarify a couple things quickly on that. Number one, I did represent the developer on Legacy Bend. Um, Legacy Bend is a multi-phased project that is not dead or dying or not going anywhere. Like almost every housing subdivision in the, maybe the country, but for sure in outstate Nebraska, they've all ground to a bit of a halt over the last couple years. I got a developer I talked quite often with. He used to do, I think, about 60 homes a year. He started his first two spec homes in two years. Housing has slowed down. Um, that's what it is. I did speak with Andrew Tupin, who took over my role at Innate Development for Legacy Bend, and I believe tomorrow at some point there's a meeting with the developers and the people that live at Legacy Bend to help clarify that. All right, I think that's all we need. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about it. All right, from now, but for the best, rest of this meeting, let's try to stay on this, this particular subject, okay? Just, just to add to that, one thing I'll add is, it, I've obviously worked on Legacy Bend, um, and with a project like that, when it is a, one of those longer phase subdivisions, we issue bonds by phases so that you're not issuing all of the TIF money that they might receive at the end point right up front. So they have to kind of go through those phases and they're only getting as much TIF as they proceed. So it, it is not as if the, the city has issued the, you know, the full amount of, of TIF that it may be entitled to and they'll have to continue to build in order to see, receive those benefits just for, for the benefit of, of the public to know that, how that process works. All right, anybody else would like to speak? Good evening, Council. My name's Scott Williams. I live at 1111 Nebraska Avenue. And I don't want to take a lot of your time tonight, but I do want to address the resolution uh, that you're going to be voting on here to, in a few minutes. Um, I sat through the blighted and substandard study by Mr. Elder uh, two weeks ago, well, three weeks ago, I guess. And um, it appears to me that this property uh, qualifies clearly as uh, meeting the definition of extremely blighted and substandard. Um, your approval tonight will allow uh, redevelopment of First Norfolk Avenue to move forward. And like Mr. Uh, Otto has said more than once, I really think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to move the downtown of Norfolk that will alter, alter the positively downtown Norfolk forever. Um, I also think more, more importantly, that uh, approval also signals to, North, to developers, other developers, that Norfolk is open for business. It signals that we want to keep growing and po prospering. And uh, why is this important? Because I think the word partnership was used just a little bit ago, that uh, us, Norfolk, in, uh, partnering with these developers tells them that we, are, we welcome their investment and we want, to be, want you to be successful in your development, in your project. And also, it, the message also says to the entire state that we want to continue to move our, our community forward. So a 32 or $34 million project does, just doesn't drop out of the sky. Um, I think it was said two weeks ago that this property has been, uh, I think you mentioned this, Shane, has sat vacant, not vacant, but unused really for like 14 years since Alco moved out. And um, I believe that redevelopment of this property would not move forward, but for TIF, that's the question, but for TIF, will this move forward? Then as an extension of that thought, I firmly believe that without the extended TIF that comes with the extremely blighted and substandard uh, designation that this project 
just doesn't happen. So um, it's a big decision. Uh, I think it's a good decision, and I uh, ask you to vote unanimously to approve the resolution that you're going to vote to on here shortly. Thank you. Jim McKenzie, first of all, if the developer was coming to the city with a redevelopment plan for First and Norfolk Avenue that used the developer's money only and no public money, I'd be very supportive if the project was well thought out and complete. But this development is asking for a 20-year TIF contribution of an unknown amount of dollars. I just heard 4.5 million, but you have to add 20 years of interest at 7% on top of that. So what's that total? Was that 10 million? Is that total $10 million of taxes that won't come into the community or other political subdivisions over that 20 year period of time? I don't know. We still don't know the answer to that. The city's never approved a 20 year TIF ever before that I'm aware of. In a TIF development, the city of Norfolk will have to provide police, fire, EMT, building, code enforcement, administration, streets, engineering, and all other city services to the businesses and residents of the development for 20 years with zero new property tax support. That means somebody else is paying for it. It doesn't come free. We're getting zero additional property taxes for 20 years on a TIF development. That will most likely mean a property tax increase on the rest of us to make up for the tax revenue that will go to the property owner to pay for those city services. Second of all, where is your TIF policy? I've been asking at these meetings for well over a year now for the city to develop a TIF policy about how and when you will use TIF and how you will limit TIF. Nothing has happened. No policy has been developed. And now we're upping the ante from 15 years to 20 years of TIF. We're going in the wrong direction. And why 20 years of TIF? I've not seen any public discussion as to why we need 20 years of TIF. When and where has this discussion ever taken place? Conflict of interest. We brought that up a little bit. I have a difference of opinion on what was just recently stated. I heard differently from others who've talked to the Accountability Disclosure Commission, but we won't go into the details on that. By offering 20 years of TIF, this property becomes more, more valuable to the developer. It certainly begs the question about how that conflict of interest enters into where that money goes ultimately but we'll, we'll pass on that. Let's talk about the extreme blight designation. How can this possibly be an extremely blighted piece of property? It sits on a high traffic corner right next to a park that has received a city investment of at least $16 million. If this corner is extremely blighted, then what is the rest of Norfolk? Seriously, what is the rest of Norfolk if this is extremely blighted? The whole blight designation process is truly a farce. How can the blight study pick and choose certain census tracts simply to fit their agenda to come up with a high unemployment rate of 6.9% and a high poverty rate of 21.4%? It appears to me, and I'm not an expert in this, but I don't know that anybody is, that the process seems to intentionally have left out adjacent census blocks that are more affluent just to get the desired results. Does this fit the spirit of what the legislature had in mind when they created extremely blighted statutes? I don't think so. I believe the extremely blighted designation was intended for truly high poverty and high unemployment areas. This certainly is not that. Why not, to try, why not try to entice a more modest investment, let's say a $15 million, $20 million investment that doesn't require TIF, that can afford to pay their fair share of property taxes. Thus, this could ultimately result in more property taxes being paid to the city over the next 40 years than the larger TIF project. The TIF project digs us into a 20-year hole in which the city receives no incremental property taxes 
and actually a decrease in property taxes due to the clearing of the north end of the property to pay for city services for that first full 20 years. Someone has to pay for it. And the developer, we've already talked about that a little bit, but the developer's 2020, excuse me, the developer's March 1, 2024 press release said, Otto's track record in community-driven development is underscored by his previous involvement in Legacy Bend, a successful, walkable community with burgeoning park spaces. His dedication to creating vibrant, sustainable urban environments serves as a cornerstone for the future of Norfolk. In December 5th of 2017, Norfolk Daily News story talking about the Legacy Bend redevelopment. Project developer Mark Otto told commissioners that he did not just want to create places to live, but that he wanted to create a way of life. Otto said he also wants to build a walkable neighborhood. People are so involved in their neighborhood, they spend their time out of their house interacting with their neighbors, Otto said. That's really what we're after. We want to create an urban feel while embracing small town Nebraska, which is about neighbor helping neighbor. Along those lines, Otto wants to create what he calls a 20 mile per hour neighborhood where residents can feel safe when they get out and walk. What you do it with is landscaping and street design as opposed to street numbers, Otto said. I know that there's designs by street numbers and guidelines that we have to follow, but at the same time, when you design streets correctly and landscaping around it, people slow down naturally. That is what we're really after, a pedestrian first neighborhood. The article goes on to say that Legacy Bend will occupy a total of 80 acres. When finished, the development will include 175 single family homes, uh, 51 townhomes and 224 apartments. Jim. Is this the same Legacy Bend we just heard about a couple weeks ago about the restrictions on speeding, restrictions on parking, the speeding through residential areas and concerns for children playing outside and only one entrance in and out of the development and parks that have never even been started. At my last count, there's only 20 single family homes built of the 175 mentioned in the story and nowhere near the number of townhomes. Do, Do we really wanna commit significant TIF tax breaks to this developer with this track record? I'm sorry, I just gotta be honest. You gotta tell it like it is. Jim, we've been, we're way over five minutes right now. All right. Um, and I'm trying to be nice I'm about gonna it, be but... real, one more quick thing, parking concerns. I see from meeting notes from my public records request that there's a significant parking concern. It looks like it's being rezoned to C2 to, to, I assume, to avoid a required number of parking spaces. It looks like it'll contain 99 one-bedroom apartments, 31 two-bedroom apartments. If I'm saying one, per, one person per bedroom, that's 161 tenants. At one vehicle per tenant, that's 161 vehicles. Where will they all park? Where will their guests park? Where will people park for events at the YMCA facility? And where will people park at events at Johnson's Park? I see discussion on a possible parking garage needed on the south side of Norfolk. Who will pay for the construction of that garage? And who will pay for the operation of that garage? All right, all right, that, Jim, come on. You gotta be fair to everybody else. We got it's, a lot more people out here wanna say something. And Thank you very much. I just urge you to have great caution with this. Appreciate your time, but it's. You can have my five minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll finish, I'll, I'll finish do up. It. I don't wanna overuse your time. Right. I just okay. urge you to have caution with this. Let's look at a better solution that doesn't ask for 20 years of TIF and better fits the downtown area and the land and parking available. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? I'm Rod Wilkie, and uh, Shane, um, I timed the first fellow that was up here, and you cut off Jim, um, and I don't know why, because the first fellow that was up here took more time than you allowed him. Yep. So, and I don't know why that is, but when the public is here, when the public is here to address major changes in this community, you need to listen no matter what the time. And I know you scheduled this time at 5.30 p.m. on a time when people are just getting off work 
where a lot of families are wanting to sit down with families and be a family and eat. But this city has scheduled this time to avoid public input. And that is a fact. You don't want to know what we really think and feel. And you just shut off Jim McKenzie. Well, to be fair, to be so just be, just listen, listen. No, no. I am listen, listening. This is my time. You asked me a question, so I was going to answer it for you. You're not going to lose any time on this part. When we allow the five minutes, which we've traditionally done, once we start allowing, we ask questions, then you can talk through that time. So when he presented, he presented in five minutes because she's got a clock right here sitting next. And then we asked him questions. It so we took had more. him far more than five but, minutes to, to go through all of that if and you're, all we're, of his Once time. we start asking questions, it, it kind of starts throwing that time out the window. All right. Okay? My point is that property that you are addressing tonight is not extremely blighted. Scott just got up here and said it is not utilized. It seems to me like there is a laundromat in that community, in that property, who is achieving revenue. There are service uh, departments in that property. Are there not? That property is being used. It is not extremely blighted. And for this city to try to push that through to the public to achieve something that we don't desire is not right. You have a developer coming, wants to come in, if they want to buy that property and level it, fine. But they don't need to do that on the backs of the taxpayers with tax increment financing. Bar none. If you want to provide TIF, then do that. I represent a backbone for those in construction. There are supportive beams. This, this guy and this age group are providing the supportive beams for this community. And you are trying to level us and it's not right. If a developer thinks this is a grand scheme, fine, let them come in. But forget the TIF. It is not right for us because we will pick up that burden. And that burden is becoming so great that maybe half of the households in this community should sell and move away and just leave you with what you want. Somebody has to pay the bill, and it's on our backs with TIF. So forget the TIF and let this guy come in. If they want to build something grand, let them build it. But that is on their back, not ours. We have empty facilities in this town. Uh, I've seen this scheme of what they want to build in all these shops. I did a tour of this town today. There's 4,500 square feet right out here on West Norfolk Avenue. Uh, Dollar, Street, uh, Dollar Tree is closing out. There's an urgent care facility north of Hy-Vee West that is empty, sitting there. There are nine doors empty, nine stores in the uh, Pazwalk Plaza, empty. The mall is virtually empty. There are doors downtown that are empty. We don't need somebody else coming in and promising that they got grand shops by a ditch. It's a drainage ditch that will carry silt across those beautiful rock that are put in. It, it's a dream. 
let's fill what we have, the empty spaces, and not put it on the backs of the structure of this city. And that's people like me. We can't afford this anymore, people. And I don't know where you've been brainwashed, but it won't work long term. So please consider that when you provide TIF to anybody. If it's a good deal, let them have at it. It's on their back at their risk, not ours. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? My name is Jamie Mukes. I'm a branch manager at Aventure Staffing. I am one of the businesses that is in the building. I have had a lot of concerns about how it has moved along and the quickness of it and not being informed of what is going on. I am not happy about um, you guys saying that the building hasn't been of use for 14 years. The laundromat has been in there which has provided a great service. The Liberty Center has been in there. Department of Labor has been in there. Aventure is in there and Equus is in there now. Previously, Mosaic was in there um, and then uh, the uh, Veterans Club was in there. Those are all services that have provided this community. You may not have used them, but a large part of this community has used every one of those businesses. And now we are being displaced, being told we are going to get help finding a new location. And like you said, there are many places that are available, but they are not affordable. And that is a huge concern that I have for my business. I don't know where we're going to go. I have been looking for a year and a half. We have not been able to find a location that we can afford, that we will be visible, that will not hurt our business. There's a business in that building that doesn't even know that there's a move out date. They didn't even know. I visited them Friday asking how things are moving along. Is anybody helping you? Has anybody communicated with you? She said, no, I'm just reporting to my director what I'm seeing in the paper. Did you know July 1st is our move out date? That we are supposed to be moved out or have a plan in place? No, I did not know this. Why? Why are we not informed? Why have we not received anything written? Why is there a business that does not even know what's going on? My, my concern is how fast this is moving along and, and how uninformed everybody is with this project. Why? I, I just feel that we deserve to know why these things are happening. And, and now you're saying something is happening in June construction's going to start in June, but we don't have to be moved out till July 1st. A lot of this is not adding up. So do we need to be out in June, or is it July? Or is it technically what we were told a year and a half ago that we were going to be given a six month out, which should be September 1st if we received something in writing April 1st or March 1st when we were told? That's all I have. Steve Sunderman, 435 and a half West Norfolk Avenue. Hi. As you guys know, I'm uh, chair of the Greater Norfolk Economic Development Foundation. Uh, we're the foundation that owns the property that is in front of you guys for the Extreme Blight study. Um, I just want to answer some of the things that you guys are kind of hearing. Um, I appreciate the comments. I know there's a, it's a pretty charged issue 
especially when people are involved that currently are in those spaces. Um, as chair, I just want to make sure that you guys know that as our Economic Development Foundation, you know, our goal is to try and make whatever uh, works for all the current tenants, but the future development as well. And so, you know, Jamie, we, we've sat with you and, and we've actually looked at spaces. Um, and so we really do care about uh, finding a space that fits you guys if this does close. But we also realize that this property may not get closed on and we may continue to operate as is. Um, we've, we've put in a ton of time. Um, you know, Jim, I know you, this is the second me in the row that you've, you've kind of um, alluded to personal um, gain being made by people of the foundation. You know, when it comes to the Great North Economic De Development Foundation, it's a nonprofit that's run by volunteers, uh, myself being one of them. You know, we've put a lot of time into this to try and see this development through and, and, and find a development that fits for the community and, and makes it forward. And there's no financial gain uh, by anybody on the, on the nonprofit, even if people want to allude to it. And so I just want to answer some of those questions for you folks um, in the room, but also the council. Um, we continue to work forward on this and um, look forward to any questions that you may have for us. Any questions for Steve? Thanks, guys. Clayton Ellsworth, uh, experience with TIFF is, it's always been a pet peeve of mine that uh, TIFF is uh, not today what it originally was for. And I think Jim had his main point that I, th I liked was the fact that you need a real good plan for deciding who gets TIF and whether it benefits the community enough to justify all the extreme cost that it usually puts on to the rest of the city. Uh, you're caught in a catch-22 because every town in the state goes for TIF financing. Uh, I spent a good share of the afternoon researching the state TIF programs and uh, this extremely blighted area is I think the big hurdle here and it seems like Omaha and Lincoln are doing a tremendous job of classifying everything blighted so they can get the contractors and all can get the TIF financing. Now, I think that my, my main point is that the regular TIF for 15 years is a long time the way it is. And I think that uh, if um, some method would be that if they showed the good faith for 10 years, maybe you can extend something. I don't know whether that's possible or not. But I think the council should really weigh this in as whether it should be the 15 year regular TIF or the blighted area TIF. Because the blighted area, I can't see where that is blighted in my looking at all the different blighted areas. Now, North Omaha. They, de they designated a tremendous area blighted, and that some of that has got some real questions whether it should have been blighted also, extremely blighted. Uh, we've got a packing house down here that uh, the city spent a lot of money to bring that to town. 
and it sits there empty today. And uh, our sewer was expanded before that. And it, uh, at a cost to the local taxpayers, everybody here. So there is added cost to every taxpayer here whenever TISP money is used. And that's all I've got to say. If you got any questions, I'm really to answer it. Thank you. I just want to remind everybody we are really only talking about the public hearing for the extremely blight determination of this. So we, if we can stay kind of on that sort of topic, because we, we vary off that a little bit and we kind of stay on that. This is not the TIF approval reading. This is just the study for the, um, to consider extreme blight. So I know that leads into the next phase, obviously, but that's all you're doing tonight, just so you know. Anybody else have anything they want to say? <clears throat> okay, can you do the planning zoning report for me? The Norfolk Planning Commission held a public hearing to hear comments on and review the extremely blighted determination study for the area referred to as extremely blighted determination study area generally located at the northeast corner of the First Street, Norfolk Avenue, on March 19, 2024. The Planning Commission recommends approval of the declaration uh, with a 5-0 to zero vote. Okay, with that, I'll close the hearing. And now I need a motion um, to adopt or consider resolution number 2024-16, approving the extremely blighted de determination for the area located at 105 East Norfolk, Northeast corner of North and First Street and East Norfolk Avenue. I'll make a consideration of approval for resolution 2024-16. Second. Discussion? I'll, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll just say there's some differences here. What we've, what we're doing here than what we've done in the past as far as my time on council. Um, if you want to keep to talking just about the extreme blight, you can talk about the 16 million in this backyard. You can talk about all the development that's been around this property. You can talk about the use of this property as it says today. Um, there's things that the council hasn't done. Most, most TIF projects that have come before us have not been this hot button topic. Um, one, making this a hot button topic is it's occupied. We have never played a role in um, designating something as extremely blighted or blighted and then ruining the occupancy of a, of a property or or being a part of people having to leave the property because of the designation. So I just want, as, as a councilman, this is what I consider. I, I, these are the things that I'm considering, is the investment all around this property and the role we're playing in the businesses that are in this building right now. It's not empty. So... I might have a follow-up question to that. And Steve, I probably should have asked you this uh, when you were up at the podium, but was, I mean, did the tenants get proper notice of this particular move? Yeah, Frank, we've been in touch with all the current tenants. And um, the fact of the matter, that the purse screen we have, um, the developer will take on all current leases. And so we have chosen to assist them with that because we feel like our role as a community player, as a nonprofit, Economic Development Foundation is to make sure that people find a, a good home, whether that's currently where they're at now or whether that's in a space um, after this development takes place. But um, leases are still going to be honored either way. So that, that's one thing to really highlight. No one's going to get kicked out because um, this property gets closed on. You know, we're, we're the, whether it's us or whether it's uh, Mark and the new developer, um, they're going to have to find relocation for those people. So that, I think that's just an important thing to highlight. This isn't about kicking anybody out. That, that's not, that's not going to happen. So. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thank you. What is the proper notice? Steve, real quick. What's, so the developer will honor the leases, and what's the, what's the extent of the leases there right now? What's the so it depends on the tenant. You know, some leases we have are month to month. Some are multiple years. And so it's going to be up to 
um, the tenant and him to, to figure that out, but we're assisting that as well because we want to see this project move forward. So um, in terms of um, notice, you know, it, it, we've been doing our best to have transparency around this process, letting people know, hey, this is the, the schedule in terms of what's going to appear in front of you guys potentially. Um, this is potentially when the property could close, but in reality, um, these are the leases in place and we have to honor those leases. So no matter what happens here, um, that doesn't change what the leases are. So there was a comment earlier that uh, someone was not aware of a uh, potential move out date. Sure. Were, were they given written notice? Well, so there is no move out date, Frank. You know, oh. so there, there is no written notice for any of these folks. There, there is no move out dates. You know, we are working with them individually to have plans in place. So if we would close it, there would be that opportunity to, to have them move. Um, I just want to be clear about that. There's, we're not giving them a move out date. You know, we're creating plans in place so that Mark can follow the schedule that he'd like to, to move forward with development if we do get it closed on. So, any other questions? There was a question back here that you didn't respond to. We, we did receive verbal, a yeah. verbal phone call. Yeah. On, yep. on what was that, the first? Um, my office, um, they reached out to corporate. Yeah. But Equus did not. Yeah, did so. The phone call did not get sure. anything in writing. Sure. They did not even know that there was a move out date, but your guys' words were, we need to be moved out on July 1st or have a plan or date of the yeah. This is, this is between, I mean, yeah, I understand the, yeah, the, yeah. Jamie, just for Equus, we, we, we've been, I understand, we, we were in touch with their state office. Absolutely. So I, I apologize that the local person hadn't been communicated with the state, but I, I understand the, the situation there. So I, I appreciate that. Any other questions? Any questions for Steve? Thank you. Thanks. 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 Any other, any other discussion? Okay. Roll call. Voting in the affirmative, McCarthy, Granquist, Arns, Hildebrand, Claussen, Murin. Voting in opposition, Webb and Snorton. Resolution 2024-16 is adopted. We're now to the uh, regular agenda. Need a motion to consider approval amendment to the engineering services agreed dated November 21st, 2022 with HDR Engineering Inc. For the levy certification phase 3A project for an additional amount of $53,284.00. I'll make a motion to approve uh, amendment to the engineering services agreement dated November 21st, 2022 with HDR Engineering. Second. Count, council and uh, Council President. Steve. Yeah. I'll kind of kick this off and introduce um, Paul Woodward with HDR. Uh, he is here to talk about this amendment, the, the reason for the amendment uh, as it impacts the project, um, and then also just provide a general update to the levy recertification project that HDR has been working on. Um, he does have a, a a presentation as well if you would desire to go a little bit deeper than his comments he's he's certainly prepared to do that so I'll turn it over to, to Paul uh, Woodward from HDR all right good evening um, thank you Paul Woodward I'm a co-project manager with HDR HDR is located at 1917 South 67th Street in Omaha um, this is a multi-phase project you've, you've heard about it before um, what's I kind of want just to address where we're at and um, kind of what the purpose of the amendment is and then answer any questions you would have. So 
Uh, where we're at is we're in the middle of going from a preliminary design into 60% design, uh, which is where we'll get into quite a few more details with that. Um, and part of this is not only the engineering, but also the environmental permitting and the permissions we need to get from the Corps of Engineers. So there's quite a bit of, of work to finish up there. So when we first kicked off this phase of the project and brought forward the, the contract that we have today, um, we had some idea that there was a couple of spots that needed to be looked at from seepage. So on the dry side of the levee, there could be potential impacts from water seeping underneath the levee um, and impacting those areas. Um, kind of following that, the Corps of Engineers did come out with a, a new study that they were doing with the state, the Department of Natural Resources. And in that case, the amount of water, so this is kind of following the 2019 flood, that they predicted that's going to come down that channel um, for the, this is for the 100 year flood, went up two and a half times. So that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't affect the, the levee, the height of the levees is still good in protecting from that flood event, but the water level did go up inside the levees, and that affects how we analyze how much water, seepage water, could get on the outside of the levees and affect that. So the real reason for the amendment is to go back. We now have the geotechnical borings done, um, and uh, that took some approval from the Corps, but that's done. Uh, so we can take that and this change in elevation of water surface and reanalyze all those areas we looked at before. So we still think, so that analysis has to be done. We still think we're going to end up with four or five locations that are potentially going to require work to be done to address the situation. Um, but that won't really, that's kind of, doesn't change a lot from where we're at now. So that's really the, the purpose is to reanalyze those areas design the mitigation to match the conditions that we, as we know them today, um, and then keep moving forward. So the schedule would then be, it moves about our total schedule from what we presented or what we had in our original contract to what we have in this amendment is about um, five to six months difference, uh, kind of going from July to the end of this year um, to do this 60% phase that gets us to the point where we're ready to head into final design and permitting of the project. So that's where we're at. And that's the reason for the amendment. Um, I don't really have a lot of other details unless you want to look at some of them, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Paul, I just have one question. Are yep. we still on track for getting our certification when we need to have it done by? Yeah. So the um, kind of the situation there has changed from, <clears throat> Now, this has probably been ongoing for five years, that uh, at that time, the Corps and the state were doing the study that was going to update the floodplain maps, and that was going to push us having to have this done by a certain time. They've kind of suspended that study for now. Um, we still want to get it done and get it certified, because that would be mean that you're ahead of the curve when they do come back to finish those flood maps, but we're not operating really on a deadline anymore. So... Hopefully we can do things that help the schedule and the, I don't know if it helps to push out the cost, but it helps us maybe from a city budget standpoint, maybe from a how you plan for this standpoint. It's not like you have to get it all done in a year. I knew initially that was, there was a time crunch on it to get it all done. So yep. just wanted to verify that. Yeah, Thank we you. don't know when that study might come back, but for right now we're not operating with the deadline. All right. Thank you. Yep. Do you foresee with the new, uh, FEMA changes on where you have to um, have your water elevation increasing the cost of this project substantially or is it you're you're really working on the same things you just have to go into some redesign because of the changes by FEMA right now we're hoping it doesn't change any of those outside of the levy protection measures by much it might a little um, it certainly doesn't do anything from a we have to change the levy height or we have to change anything with the uh, concrete and the structures there so a lot of that stays the same so there's not huge implications but I, but I think there could be some yeah. are you foreseeing any other change orders coming forward with with phase three here not with phase three you know I, I anticipate we'll complete this by the end of the year 
hopefully that's when we can have everything done to enough extent that we can have the the permits the environmental permit and then the approvals to go to the core kind of ready we kind of start those at 60 percent knowing that we're going to change and then they're going to have comments um so the plan would be we finish this contract out uh there will be a, another contract for um phase 3b that's the final design so hopefully we'll learn take what we've learned from what we've done here and apply that to the final contract so we're not avoiding more amendments if if that's the case so total completion time would be what would the time frame be uh we're probably looking to uh finalize the design next year so, so if this goes to the 2024 we we know permitting will probably take at least a year okay so while they're while they're deciding while they're reviewing a lot of the permit stuff we'll be moving forward on design um but yeah, at least a year, at least 2025 before we could even then go out to construction in 2026 is about where we're at now. This is the levy from all the way from North First Street all the way down past Omaha Avenue, correct? I mean, it's the whole, the whole thing. The whole right. thing, and it's on, eventually it's on both sides yeah. yep. from the railroad tracks down um, past Highway 275. And The other parts of the project are just to uh, replace a couple of the culverts that go through the levee. Now, when we replace those, we make them bigger. Uh, we put in a big gate well that's on set that wasn't put in initially by the core. Um, and those are kind of like reset. Like now you've got hopefully another 50 to 100 years that those are going to last you. Um, and some of it still clean up and fix up from some of 2019 damage. Uh, a lot of where those channels go out from those pipes go out to the middle of the channel were messed up um, silt as the flood went down a lot of silt was deposited so we're looking at addressing that those are those are the other besides the seepage mitigation issues those are the, those are the other things yep. I think it's safe to say the elephant in the room is who pays for it and the federal government is not helping at all am I right they can change their standards but it's on us to make sure we get it fixed and certified so that any homeowners or any i mean this i honestly affects all of downtown even of being in a floodplain if that's not considered an actual levy that's certified yeah. sound right yeah we are currently not working with any other outside funding but also is it true that if we do not do the certification then if the bad thing happens we're not um, able to get the FEMA funding. Well, the, or not then as they much. potentially change the FEMA maps, and that just reflects the floodplain, like without the levee there. So it is not helpful for um, insurance and all that stuff. But it, you know, the flood protection is still there. It's just they changed the map for it. Councilman, uh, a little bit more to that is when a flood does occur, like the 2019 flood, we also get support from the Corps of Engineers office to come back in and help restore the levee back to pre-flood conditions. Some of what's going to be done here as part of the recertification is take care of like some of these outfalls that come through that over the 50 or 60 years, the levee's been there a little over 50 years, um, that have not been maintained to what's called the original constructed condition and so as a function of that when the flood occurred there was additional damage done to some of those structures but the Corps was not going to participate in the rehab of those because they were not to the original O&M condition when the flood occurred um, a heavy piece of the recertification is also going to be related to that on what we call the table when you look down inside the levee you'll see a low flow channel you got the big levee walls on the east and west side and then there's a table down there and that table is supposed to flow in towards the low flow channel um, in most cases there's probably two three four feet of silt that settled on that table right up along the low flow channel and so water can't just sheet flow in and drop down into that channel um, as a function of that there was 
some additional erosion and stuff that was occurring up along where the levee meets that table. And so this project here will go in there and recreate, again, that original cross-section that was constructed so that those tables, uh, the drainage flow is correct inside there. And again, if another flood was to occur five years from now, ten years from now, whenever, any damage would be um, eligible for core, uh, the Corps of Engineers' uh, support to come in and, and reconstruct that. Any further discussion? Steve, so where we set today, I'm sorry, I'm new to this, but where we set today, we're, we're okay? Like there's no, there's no areas of concern? Um, well, some of these outfalls are a little bit of a concern, but um, if there was to be a flood event today, would the levee hold? Yes. Uh, you know, if a, a similar size event to what we had in 2019, um, the levee would hold. Um, there would just be more silt built up on the table that we would still have to deal with. We wouldn't have any, we'd probably have less Corps of Engineers support than we had last time uh, when they came in there and, and did some, uh, provided some assistance and, and some um, funding for the, the rehab of the levy. So you were talking about how this would be 2025 and then 2026 you'd be a year from now before that final uh, <coughs> concept was was brought up and we're at 60 percent now why why is it going to take a year to get to that final one uh, a lot of that will be the permitting process and the approval by the core um, so we'll get this stuff submitted to them let them start the review provide comments back but it's it's likely as we get to that final design that they'll Get more rigorous with their comments, knowing that they're trying to get to a. This is actually what's going to be built, and then um, so that's kind of the end, end of the year. We anticipate both getting there's an environmental permit piece that you have to get for any impacted wetlands or issues, and then there's the approval by the court to do any modifications. They still consider this well, and because of the the program where they come back and inspect it and make sure it's it's up to their standards. Um, so they still consider this a change to the project they initially built. And that's why you got to get their, their approval. Other questions? All right. So this is just for the 53,000, Steve? That's correct. Okay. That's it? All right. Roll call. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Motion carries. All right, I need a motion to cons consider item 31, consideration of approval for to advertise for bids for the water pollution control plan improvement project. Steve. Consideration. Sorry, go ahead. All our consideration of advertising bids for the water per, water pollution control plan improvements. Second. Right, Steve. I will direct this at you. Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and introduce it, to council members. Yeah, this is uh, this is permission to advertise for the uh, what we call the grit grit facility and uh, improvements at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we had gone out, we had bid this in the fall of 2022. Bids came in quite a bit higher than what were expected. Uh, some of that relative to coming out of COVID and the, the whole supply chain squeeze and cost of materials increases. Um, so we, we just shelved the project uh, for a while. We also went out and pursued some grants funding. We did receive uh, one point, I'm looking here, Seems like we received 1.5 million in what's called a QCT recovery grant, which has uh, it's the funding towards uh, uh, census tracts that meet certain conditions, uh, which this one did. Even and so we received that 1.5 million dollar grant. Um, so anyway, this is back on the table. I do have the design uh, firm here. Olson was the designer on this. And um, I'd like, kind of like to have 
Seth Lange come up and just be prepared to answer answer questions as you as you have questions. So I wanted to bring Olson has been our the engineer for our wastewater plant uh, for some time. Olson did the 2020 master plan uh, along with some some portions of that that were supported by Black and Veatch, um, but. Olson's did the 2020 master plan. They've done the design on this. And uh, again, they're the, they're the experts. They're our wastewater experts and would be able to answer any questions you would have. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, good evening, council. Uh, basically what we're looking at here is the replacement of the grip building and um, the pumps within the, the system. Um, as of right now, the system was created or was built what back in 1950 early 1950s um, some improvements have been done um, in 19 early uh, around 1970s and so forth um, basically what this system is it's 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 showing its age um, and the proposal that or the design that we've provided to you um, will provide um, some additional uh, hydraulic flow to the to the plant, not necessarily treatment flow to the plant, um, which will be helpful um, and provide some redundancy to our system. Um, basically, what we want to look at is replacing our old technology, that older technology that we have with the existing grit system and um, uh, putting it with newer technology that will help with maintenance uh, and so forth. If there's any questions, let me know. Seth, are these plans 100% done? Yes. Okay. So this is this is just time is time has ran its course. Yes. And what we have. Yeah. I mean, if we go back to 54, 1970 from the last time the grid improvement. So at facility. that point in time, basically what what the grit system was was kind of more or less an aeration basin um, that allowed. Um, so grit, um, as you know, is uh, your gravels, sands, rocks, uh, so forth that come through the system, um, and uh, how it was provided or how it is provided now is an aeration basin. Um, uh, uh, I think our the city's team they, they have maintenance issues that they have with it with additional grit getting that's not being captured that's getting into the additional into the system, so getting more into the plant which would hopefully would uh, wear on the additional parts that are within the system. So with the new uh, product that we have, or with the new design that we have, it allows for less of that grit to you know, get, get into the rest of the plant and so forth. So it'll help with piping, it'll help with yep. pumps, it'll help with yep. everything that the sewer plant yep. does. Correct. Because this, this is the beginning of the sewer plant. Yes, yep. correct, correct. So if it's saving on maintenance costs, essentially, long-term, from what long they have term, now? Long-term, yeah. And Is there any idea what that saving Yeah, I, we couldn't really tell you at this point okay. in time. Seth, and that, that new design that you come up with, the old system would then simply go away, right? Yes. It would all flow through this? Yep. Okay. And then that will that also increase the amount you're talking um, it increases the flow. It increases right? the flow. It does not increase the amount of uh, material we can treat. Or we amount can, of, we amount can of, treat, but it yes. increases the flow in there. It can, it can increase the flow, yes. Okay. So increased flow, but without increased quality. It more or less provides work? a redundancy to it. Um, okay. So, for instance, now, if anything were to happen, we don't have a redundant system to allow for us to keep running if something were to happen. And what we want to look at this is being more proactive than reactive right now. And we're kind of getting into that phase where we're kind of being reactive right now and the possible of an emergency situation that could happen. This is just to go out for bid. So this will come back in front of us, right, Steve, once they, they get the bid? That's correct, Councilman. Thanks. I believe we're looking, oh, it's probably on, on the back of my agenda here. I think we're advertising this six weeks, if I recall correctly. Seven, uh, seven weeks. So it'd be back for council, looks like the second meeting in May. We would anticipate coming back with a, a conversation around awarding a bid. Thank you. Any further discussion? <coughs> All right. 
Uh, hearing none, please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Motion carries. All right. Let's see. We need a need consideration of resolution number 2024-17, approving a sidewalk waiver request requested by Todd and Cherry Ludican for the property located at 3530 East Highway 24. Um, Val? Direct this to, oh, yeah, okay. I'm jumping the gun. I'll, I'll make, make a motion, motion for consideration, consideration of resolution number 2024-17. Second. Sorry. Yeah, speak up. <laughs> All right. Val, you want to speak on this? Yes, please. Okay. So, yes, this is a sidewalk waiver before you all. This is kind of our east, southeast, close to our ETJ line. Um, and so what happened was it was a larger parcel out there, zoned RR, and they replatted. And so we have that uh, sidewalk note in, that all new plats have that sidewalk requirement. And there are no sidewalks anywhere really close to on Highway 24 out that far. And so what is before you is our kind of standard proposal for a temporary sidewalk waiver that it's in effect until uh, sidewalks installed in the abutting area and that it shall include provisions and grading for future sidewalk installation and that area remain free from other landscaping and land development so that when the sidewalk does make it out there, we're not trying to work around things that got put in years earlier. And that also the council reserves the right to request the installation of sidewalks at any time. So if you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer. I Google map that and I think they'd be the only ones with sidewalks, so. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of addition on that. So this being the southeast corner of the community, this would be the last area of the community that we would ever grow to. Um, it's down river, so we'd have to be pumping, you know, there'd have to be a large lift station uh, built way out there to pump all that stuff back to the city. We're gonna grow to the northwest, the west, the, the northeast, the east, way before we ever grow this direction. So that'd be a long time before I would ever, potentially ever see sidewalk being uh, adjacent to that property. Well, hearing that, any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Resolution 2024-17 is adopted. All right, I need a motion for consideration of ordinance. Oh, this is the first reading also. For the consideration of ordinance number 5873, authorizing a special assessment bond anticipated notes in the principal amount not to exceed 485,000 for water district uh, 129 and uh, Randy oh sorry oh, I got me again all over consideration of ordinance 5873 second all right Randy yes this is a parameters ordinance that will provide financing for the water district going north on 81 uh, it authorizes, as you mentioned, up to four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars of bonds, interest rate up to five and a quarter percent. I expect both of those numbers will come in lower, and it will be a bond with a six-month call maturity date of September fifteenth of twenty twenty-six. I recommend approval on three readings so we can get this financing in place and answer any questions. With this being an assessment bond, uh, the city will not be seeing any incurred cost. Correct. Uh, these costs would be paid with assessments. There's a small portion, I believe, like two or three thousand dollars, that's going to be paid from the water fund for some oversizing. But ninety-nine percent plus will be paid by special assessments. Thank you. Steve, were we able to come off Eisenhower's? That would kind of saved us the cost there with, with the with the um, cemetery. Correct, correct, Councilman. Um, when we entered design on that, we we realized that we had two different pressure zones there. Uh, there's a pressure zone at Eisenhower 
as you go down south of the cemetery, um, that's a separate pressure zone, so we cannot we can't connect those. Um, so we pulled that back, and you know, that was substantial cost savings there, probably about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cost savings. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? A short title, please. An ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of bond anticipation notes of the City of Norfolk, Nebraska, and the principal amount of not to exceed $485,000 for the purpose of providing interim financing to pay the cost of water improvements in Water Extension District Number 129, Ooh. pending the issuance of permanent general obligation various purpose bonds of the City, prescribing the form of said notes, agreeing to issue the city's general obligation various purpose bonds to pay the notes at maturity or to pay the notes from other available funds, authorizing officers of the city to make arrangements for the sale of the notes and to designate the final terms, rates, and maturity schedule for said notes within stated parameters, authorizing officers of the city to make arrangements for the sale of the notes and providing for the publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. Please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Ordinance number 5873 carries on first reading. Your Honor, seeing no uh, um, opposition to this, I'll make a motion to suspend the rules and waive the requirement for the second and third readings. Second. Any discussion? I know. Seeing none, please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Ordinance number 5873 carries on second and third. All right. Uh, we're now to administrative reports. We have a Norfolk Fire and Rescue annual, annual report. Turn over to Chief Rogge. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Tim Rogge, Fire Chief here in Norfolk. Met pretty much everybody up here, I hope, by now. Um, I'll try to make this short and sweet, but it's important to me to be able to recap uh, 2023 and the year that our team had and, and uh, say thank you to a few people for the support that we had. So we'll try to go back through. This is Enclosure 34. Hopefully you have that. Uh, if not, uh, I'll do my best to kind of summarize everything. If you notice a new format this year as opposed to what you've seen in the past, a couple of our team members are way more uh, tech savvy than I, and they would they get the credit for that. So uh, we tried to change things up a little bit. Our report uh, is a calendar year, 2023, and, and we used the numbers of 30,000 plus for population served when we start talking about city limits and outside city limits, and roughly 107, 111 square miles. Just to go back in time a little bit here, not long ago in 2019, we ran a total of 2,372 calls. Uh, the reporting number that we ran in 2023 was 3,217. So uh, it has been um, record year after record year, the last five years. And as of this morning, we were roughly 100 calls ahead of last year, already in three months time. So the teams are staying busy. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to stay fully staffed for the most part, but uh, I mention that because it, uh, it requires and asks of us to call our off-duty personnel and our mutual aid in early and often in order to keep from having to stack calls and make sure that next call gets answered. So we are very reliant upon people that are supposed to be home with their families to come back in, and they do it just because it's part of the job. So I'm very proud of our teams. Uh, we call back. When I say callback, we page out for extra help nearly 400 times a year between our level twos for emergency medical calls or level one, which is a major large scale incident where it's all hands on deck. And 87% uh, of our calls are emergency medical calls, so our ambulance calls. Uh, so we have to be really good in that area. We still have a large percentage of our staff that are paramedics. Some of our newer hires, the last five, are either recently certified EMT basics or in training for EMT and will soon be starting the paramedic program. One of the stats that jumped out to me when our lieutenants were helping put their section of this together was the pre-hospital care cardiac arrest rate for national average. So the success rates that we would have compared to national average, we're running right at 23%. Uh, but a success rate for pre-hospital cardiac arrest as compared to seven for the national average. So I know 23% doesn't seem like a lot, but it is, uh, 
it is in fact just that. And that takes a lot of hard work, a lot of early notifications, some sound work by dispatchers, some bystanders willing to step up that are trained in CPR, uh, law enforcement officers, our staff, and critical care team out of Faith West. So we're, we're proud of that number, and I'm glad that uh, the team put that in our report this year. Uh, we are very reliant on our mutual aid, as I stated earlier, our local law enforcement, uh, whether it be Chief Miller's crew or or Sheriff Volk or the state patrol folks, uh, we utilize them and their services a lot to keep us safe when we're going on calls. And we're relying upon other divisions in the city to help make us successful. And we hope to help them as much as they help us. And it's, it's a good relationship by and large. As far as staffing updates, we did lose a few folks this year. And again, we were able to hire back. I mentioned this last year, but it did happen in 2023. Scott Cordes uh, left us to become, I believe, the 24th State Fire Marshal. Uh, Bob Nelson, a uh, 35-year uh, lieutenant with Norfolk Fire and Rescue, retired. We had a promotional process that uh, resulted in Sam Funk being promoted, previously firefighter paramedic. Some of those folks that left us in a full-time capacity we were able to retain in our reserve program, which is very, very helpful to have that skill set in our reserve program. One of our fire reserves, Doug Holmberg, hit 40 years of service. Uh, Faith Peterson, 43 years and counting, announced that she's going to be retiring this spring. So uh, that's, uh, that's quite a deal. 43 years is, is something to behold and uh, very proud of her and uh, grateful to have had her on our team for so long. So. As you can imagine, trying to fill a position like that will be challenging, but I have no doubt that uh, we'll step up and, and Faith and Company will help get this new individual trained. Uh, Dr. Serber continues to be our active medical director. Uh, a year ago, I, re I reported that Dr. Serber received a Distinguished Citizenship Award from Northeast Community College. And then in this last calendar year, Doc actually had a room at Lifelong Learning Center named in his honor. Uh, he and his wife Susan have been great contributors to Northeast Community College, so we were able to join him during that program. He continues to have a strong reporting relationship with our lieutenants, our shift lieutenants on each shift, and our fire paramedics. Other notable happenings, we hosted the 9-11 uh, Memorial Stair Climb with some full and part-time staff, as along with family and friends and other citizens out at the training tower. We uh, participated in a documentary called Working Fires that PBS pushed out that uh, talked in great depths about the lack of volunteers across the state and how it's impacting the fire service in, in fire and EMS. And uh, we engage a lot with our volunteer providers around us. So it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a cool thing for our staff to be a part of that documentary and speak to how important those volunteers are to us. We continued to do some projects around the stations. We had crews take up landscaping projects, painting lots of projects at the tower, as far as rebuilding some different training props and restoring some different monuments that we've had since the beginning of time. So it was a good year for, for those types of things. Uh, Assistant Chief Trevor O'Brien continues to oversee the operations division of Norfolk Fire and Rescue, along with our three captains. Uh, Landon Grothy, Lance Grothy, and Scott Bonzel. These folks are constantly working through schedules and day-to-day you know, -day, this morning before noon, they were already six or seven calls in. So trying to balance the day-to-day -day operations with everything else that's going on as far as keeping folks trained has been very taxing on these folks, but they're doing a great job. We've been attending career fairs, hosting ride-alongs. We're now doing 24-hour ride-alongs for paramedic students from both Northeast Community College and Southeast Community College. That's been a good thing. Historically, they were only able to stay till 10 p.m., but the 24-hour shift gives you the true test of uh, what life is like. Uh, you don't sleep through the night, as, as folks sometimes think. Um, our responders running this many calls, they definitely don't all happen during the day. I'm usually in bed by nine, so I can only imagine what they're going through at night sometimes. So, uh, Our special operations such as hazardous materials, high angle rescue, swift water and drone response are things we're working on. Uh, all kinds of involvement in those areas. And our fire reserves continue to be an extremely important group to us. They're running at 32 right now. These are part-time staff that come in when we need them on any callback. 
Uh, they'll help cover when we anticipate severe weather. Uh, if we're short staff and we can't get full time to come in, they will come in and, and stay overnight and take time away from their family to help bolster our response. Uh, from a prevention aspect, our fire marshal, Sean Lindgren, and our three shift fire inspectors are out and about in the community quite often, in addition to response duties for 911, doing pre plans and, and different building inspections to try to keep things safe, uh, working hand in hand with Val's team, the building and code officials. Uh, just to keep us all safer, uh, businesses and residents and, and making sure that people are following the rules that are put forth that aren't always fun, but ultimately are resulting in uh, good fire loss numbers. Region 11, uh, Emergency Manager Bobby Reiser continues to stay very busy with exercise ed, co coordination of drills, uh, working on a multi-year process to replace our severe weather sirens and add a couple new sirens. So she's been very busy with that, with Faith assisting uh, with some school tabletops and uh, working with other local business on tabletops for active threat. So that's, that's kind of the year in a nutshell. Uh, the things that I wanted to touch on as we end up here is one of the things that was new to our annual report and something we should have done long ago is we try to remember those that that left us in the fire service this year, and this year was a was a tough year for us. We have a, if you've never been to our fire station, please come down and look at our retirees wall. Anybody that served over 20 years and met the criteria, there's a picture of them and the rank they held upon retirement. And to take two pictures off that wall this year with Bob Noli and Richard Schleck both passing, we did our best to try to honor them and their families, but it'll never be enough, and the way things go day to day and the speed of the life that we live in sometimes it takes those types of things unfortunately for us pause to pause and reflect on how good we truly have it so I know there's lots of adversity in this world and, and each of you sees that on a day-to-day -day basis but there's a lot of good things happening too and those men were two examples of tons of sacrifice over the course of their careers along with their family so in closing, I would just say that I am uh, very grateful to each of you that are sitting in this room tonight for the support that you've shown our organization and our division. We wouldn't be here without you. From the rural board, to our elected officials, to our administration, to this community, and most importantly, our families. Our, our team does not uh, take it for granted what you do for us each day, and we hope to return the favor in our response and commitment to each of you. So if you have any questions, I would take those at this time. I, <clears throat> Chief, I do have a question. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> with all the increasing numbers, I saw the, the number of calls increased, the number of visitors you get to your station increases. Um, how is your staffing? I mean, do you, do you think so it's we've adequate? I'm careful how to answer that because I would always take more staffing and I think that that's probably the sooner rather than later as far as the need to add folks and we've talked with that with our administration and, and uh, our team's tired if I'm being honest they're tired they're doing the best they can every day but it's it's taken its toll uh, we do have 10 per shift which technically keeps us full across the board we're in the process of uh, testing right now, or we're going to be testing soon to get that extra one firefighter to take us to 31. And the goal of that is if somebody leaves unexpectedly, we can rotate that extra firefighter into whichever shift goes down to nine until we get that position filled. So we want to stay at 31 as much as we can. But with the, uh, the trends continuing to go in that direction, it was very uh, obvious to me after looking at the call logs this morning and noticing that we were 100 ahead of last year in just a few months that that time is going to come for us we'll do our best to deal with the call volume with what we have now but eventually we'll probably be talking about have, adding some firefighters so. i know you mentioned uh about 87 percent of your calls come in are, are emergency related is there any opportunity or door that you could open like uh, Chief Miller has done at the Norfolk Police Division where they've implemented the community uh, service officer uh, to handle a few things that maybe a licensed uh, or certified officer did not have to do. Is there anything like that in the fire department that would 
alleviate a, a few calls? I think possibly, you know, I think there's some community medicine programs that are out there that a person could certainly look at. I know there are some communities that are doing that. Um, I don't have any good good options for that right now other than starting a different wing that maybe we could use EMT basics to handle some of those calls that wouldn't take our ambulance out of service. Um, but I don't have anything as of right now. I can certainly look into that for you. So. Anybody else? <coughs> All right. No, thanks for everything that you, you bet. do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. Tim. <clears throat> thanks, Tim. That concludes the meeting tonight. We're adjourned. <laughs>